Since the splitting of the atom only a few decades ago, and through his God-given genius of science, man, at last, has succeeded in penetrating further and further into the unknown vastness of space. The moon has become the launching base for advanced exploration. From this pivotal point, astronauts, at the risk of their lives, set out to conquer nature's mysterious forces. Yet many questions remained unanswered. What is his Earth in relation to the inconceivable number of other worlds? Is his speed truly the fastest, his achievements the greatest, or is he a mere unimportant piece of driftwood floating in the vast ocean of the universe? Could there be life similar to our own on other planets? Is it not possible that atmospheric conditions of relative environments control their shapes and forms? If so, would they be giants, or could perhaps the opposite be true? Could their intellect have reached a scientific level far above man's dreams? What then will the future reveal if this story you are about to witness is only the beginning? Log entry, Pegasus 3, March 16th, 1980. Captain Leonard Pilot, Lieutenant Webb Navigator. This is the seventh and last day of space reconnaissance research, Flight 361 from United States Air Force Lunar Base 1. We are 21,000 miles from base, bearing at 270 degrees, two, three minutes. Azimuth at plus, 46 degrees, 46 degrees, 50 oh minutes, ecliptic. On routine successive approximation by trajectory computer using data from the space position recorder. It's quiet and lonely out here. And frankly, we'll be happy to get back to that dreary old moon. We're almost a degree off trajectory, Captain. Equipment checks okay. Must be an outside acceleration force. Something approaching fast. I'm setting up auto evasive pattern. A large planetoid object is on a direct collision course with us. We are under 11 G's exterior acceleration and have no control whatsoever.
Just incredible. Two ships missing in less than a month. Nothing within thousands of miles of their position. And yet they crash into something that appears suddenly on our radar, big enough to be a planet. And then the next instant it disappears. It's against all theories of space. You got the same reports from bases two and three? It appeared for a second or two, then vanished completely. A ship is on a routine flight. Controls, rockets, everything in order. And then, all of a sudden... Yes? General Gibson for Colonel Lansfield from Earth Headquarters. Stand by. Colonel Lansfield? Lansfield, what's all the trouble up there? General, I can't tell you any more than what was in that report this morning. You're certain the rockets crashed? I am. We have their last log entry through our recording reproduction unit. Now, General, I've listened to it over and over. It tells what happened, but not how and why. What do you suggest? I don't know, General. No doubt the rocket's destroyed. We don't know what we're looking for. This mysterious planet seems to come and go at such speeds, it's impossible to track. Phantom planet, Lansfield. You're a little old to think that, aren't you? This is a capable base, General, run by capable men. Now, there's something out there that isn't supposed to be. All right, all right, take it easy. Send another reconnaissance with Chapman. Chapman? I need him for the Mars Project. If this phantom planet thing isn't cleared up, there won't be any Mars Project. Send him. Yes, sir. Ask Chapman to report. Yes, sir. Captain Chapman, report to the Colonel. <laughs> Sir, I've been testing the pressure equipment for the Mars project. Forget about that now, Chapman. You leave tomorrow morning. The general wants someone with your experience. I don't know whether to feel flattered or not. What exactly will I be looking for? A floating space monster? This is no joke, Frank. I wish it were. Sorry, sir. You know how rumors move around the space. Well, it's one of the things we hope that you'll dispel. Well, you're the colonel. I'll take a crack at anything once. And that's about all you'll get, Frank. One crack. Eighteen thousand miles out at two seven zero degrees azimuth and four seven degrees ecliptic. Speed. 4.6 miles per second. Check. Computer guidance on. Ability course on. Direction of rockets port off. Direction of rockets starboard off. Set to automatic. Check. That does it, Captain. We can relax a bit now. Takeoff's always the same. My heart pounds like a sledgehammer. Yeah, mine too. How about the screen? Never fails to fascinate me from up here. You know, Captain, every year of my life, I grow more and more convinced that the wisest and best is to fix our attention on the good and on the beautiful. If you'll just take the time to look at it. Here's yeah, some guy, McConnell. Lunar Base 1 to Pegasus 4. Lunar Base 1 to Pegasus 4. Can you read me? This is Pegasus 4 to Lunar Base 1. This is Lieutenant McConan. Colonel Lansfield for Captain Chapman. Chapman standing by. Anything out there, Frank? Nothing, Colonel. It's almost too quiet. Well, keep alert. And don't waver off your course one degree, unless you think you're on to something. And if you do get on to something, report at once. Yes, sir. Pegasus Ford, Lunar Base 1. Over. Out. I hope whatever was out there is gone now. What's our elapsed time from base? 14 hours, 22 minutes, and 30 seconds. You could stay up here another 14 hours and still see nothing. Even 1,400 hours. That's about all we can do, though. Are you sure we're still on course? Why? Well, I have an idea. Turn to 278 degrees azimuth. 047 degrees ecliptic. Yes, sir. Changing course to 278 degrees azimuth, hold 47 degrees ecliptic. 
Lansfield tells us to charter the same course Pegasus 3 took. Well, that's fine, but I don't think we'll get anywhere. If this strange planet dashes about like it's supposed to, it figures we won't find it around here. So we're changing course. Lightning never strikes twice in the same place. Chris Ashley, you with me? Like I said, you're the captain. I'll Thanks. take a new reading. Thanks, Ray. Well, you could go nuts out here just waiting for something to happen. You seem pretty much at ease. Well, I figure it's just the same as fishing. You've got to be patient and wait. Electrostatic meters going haywire. Lunar Base 1 to Pegasus 4. Can you read me? Over. Pegasus 4 to Lunar Base 1. We read you. Over. You are completely off course, Pegasus 4. Check your position immediately. E computer and spectrometer out. Pegasus 4 to Lunar Base 1. We are aware of being off course. Cannot explain at present. We are entering a heavy magnetic field. Several instruments are out and I'm afraid others are going. Give us our exact position. Over. Pegasus 4, you are... Do not hear you, Lunar Base 1. Over. Changing to the manual control. Meteor! Boy, that was close. Yeah, and I'm afraid it isn't over yet. Fading fast. What about the infrared detector? That's out too. The thing we can do is turn it 90 degrees to the shower's path. More meteors are coming, it's our only chance. That will be to 311 degrees azimuth and minus 12 degrees ecliptic. Here they come. This is it. They'll persist for a while. Well, let's hope for those dragons. Are these instruments out? There won't be any way to tell. They're coming from another direction. The trick now is to get back to the moon. I think we'll make it. Yeah. Okay, Ray, let's go through a tight B check. Right. Cabin pressure? 20 coming up. Better port? Positive. Better starboard? Positive. Main circuit one. Negative. Main two. Negative. Now let's try the auxiliaries. Main one. Negative. Main two. That's not in the circuits. You know, the meteors must have smacked into the propulsion elements. Our feed lines. Yeah, we're lucky. Well, there's only one way to find out. Looks like it. You know, there's one thing sure. What's that? They knew what they were doing when they forced us to go through those space drills dozens of times. If I remember correctly, you had a different opinion. <laughs> okay, don't rub it in.
Respect to the Colonel, sir. I don't think it's any use. Keep working that radar and keep working it until we locate Chapman. Yes, sir. He's got to be out there somewhere. He just has to be. Lieutenant McConnor. Chapman, pilot, takes the score. My ship is being drawn toward an asteroid. Instruments completely out of operation. Navigator McConan, lost. I cannot read my position. I'm going to try to land. I don't think I'll make it. If I do, I'll continue recording.
a lot of step forward.
Call the prisoner. Bring in the prisoner. Stand here, in front of our leader and our judge. Is the prisoner from another world ready to hear the charges against him? Charges? What charges? I will ask the questions. Are you ready to stand trial? It seems I have no choice. First, I want to know what I'm charged with. We'll let you know in time. What are you called? Chapman. Frank Chapman. What is your occupation in the world from which you come? I'm a captain in the Air Force of the United States, a country on Earth, space exploration wing. But you must know about us. You speak our language. We do not speak it. But here on Rayton... Rayton? Yes, Rayton. The name of our planet. Here we are able to translate all languages through voice tone waves. Why all these explanations? Let us go on with the charges. You're right, Heron. This is no time for explanations. Man from Earth, you are accused of causing injury to one of our people. I thought I was being attacked and I defended myself. I didn't want to come to your world. I lost control of my ship. It was like being pulled toward your planet by a Enormous gravitational force. You were, when you came into our path of travel. Path of travel. Phantom planet. We managed just in time to control your landing by releasing the pressure in our space warp. I don't understand. There are many things you will not understand here. Maybe in time you shall. In time? That is correct. The jury will now vote and find you guilty or not guilty for inflicting injury on a Rayton man. The verdict, Judge. find you guilty as charged. You are now a free subject of Rayton. The jury is dismissed. That is all. You are now a free subject of Rayton. That is not all. Listen, I don't know what kind of a place this is, but you must have some kind of law here. This planet pulled me to it. I didn't come here by choice. But being here, you cannot be permitted to leave. We must keep our security at any cost. So, I must pronounce you guilty. No penalties will be lodged against you. But you must become a subject of Rayton. Trial is concluded. Nothing is concluded. What is this? First I'm found guilty of something that's not my fault, and then I'm set free. Well, free to go where? Back to my world six inches tall? Don't worry. No harm will come to you. I'm Liara, Sesam's daughter. I'll show you to your quarters. Well, come, we'll talk on the way. What has happened to me? You mean your size? Well, our atmosphere, together with some acceleration from our gravitational control, has reduced you to normal. Normal? Normal for us. You see, everything here is in proportion to our planet's size. We know several worlds that have creatures larger or smaller according to the size of their world. Do you feel any different? No, but it's not exactly funny to think that someone on Earth could carry me about in their pocket. Oh, well, that would never happen. The oxygen in your atmosphere would restore you immediately to your regular size. But either way, it wouldn't matter. You'll never see your world again.
Nothing yet. No, sir. No contact for two days. I'll wait another 24 hours. Then, with or without orders, I'm sending out a search party. You wanted to see me? Yes. Will you excuse me? We must talk about your future. Your future on Rayton. My future on Rayton? I want to talk about getting back to my world, back to Earth. I'm afraid that is impossible. You might as well accept your fate, your fate of being one of us. And being one of us, you must be productive in one way or another. Well, what is it you want me to do? You must help us to keep spaceships from your world from landing here. But that's my only hope of getting back. Forget about it. Two ships in my unit disappeared. Did they crash here? Unfortunately, yes. They were pulled into our strong gravitational field. Well, so was I. Yes, but luckily we were aware of your approach. and lowered the power on our gravity field. I don't get it. In many ways, you're hundreds of years ahead of our science. Yet you live in such a primitive manner. It may not be as odd as it seems. It's true that our technology may be much further advanced than yours, but then a strange thing happened. Well, what was that? We had machines do all our work. People on Raton became completely free of all labor, practically of all responsibilities. Our people became soft and lazy. They did not know how to cope with their free time. They started to fight amongst themselves. That's very interesting. Many people on Earth are beginning to face the same problem. Too much free time, too little work. Mm. Problem not at all unique in the history of the universe. Well, what happened on Rayton? Our forefathers then made a wise decision. They returned to, as you say, our primitive ways. The Raytons again had to toil for their living. They became much stronger much happier, much more valuable. But you didn't forsake all of your scientific achievements. No, we retained the secret of the gravity control for our survival in space and the secret of our food production for our survival on this barren planet. You sacrificed advancement for this. Sesame rules us and we are content. Now, can't we get on with this, Sesame? Aaron is hasty. We all are. Our lives have been changed so much. I would like you to become acquainted with our ways. Later, you may choose a wife. With Liara or Zeta. Zeta cannot speak, but she is a fine woman. Well, between the two, it would be difficult to make a choice. It is no problem. You may take your time. But once you've made your choice, remember, it must not be taken lightly. You must be hungry. Come with me. They are. Go now and learn our ways. And perhaps you may help us with our problems. You can decide about this later. Now you need to eat and rest. equivalent of your breadfruit. We made it chemically for you since nothing grows here on this planet. Oh, here. Drink this. It's good for you and it'll help to make you rest. You need it. You say nothing grows here. Well, then how do you exist? Well, our bodies are so constructed that we need very little food because of the air we breathe. Feeling better now? I hope so. Yes. But I'd like to get out of here. You're a strange one, Frenchie. I'm a strange one. What about everybody else? And don't call me Frenchman. My name is Frank Chapman. Two words. Yes. Frank Chapman. Oh, I'm 
sorry. I didn't mean to be so rough. It's just that well, this is so new to me. You know what I'd like to do if I had a choice? What? I'd like to return to my ship. Well, that's impossible. Then you see, I'm still a prisoner. Not at all. You're free to go anywhere here on Rayton. Except to my ship. Your rocket is no longer on this planet. It was sent off last night while you were sleeping. I cannot read my position. I'm going to try to land. I don't think I'll make it. If I do, I'll continue recording. This is Captain Frank Chapman, pilot, takes support. My ship is being drawn toward an asteroid. The instrument's completely out of operation. Navigator McConan, lost. Unidentified object on screen. This must be Chapman's ship, Colonel. Certainly has all the indications and all the characteristics of a spaceship. And no other unit of ours is scheduled for flight in this area. Any contact? None, Colonel. Just static. His auto-emergency transmitter should be on full blast. I'm tuned to all Pegasus frequencies, sir. So are the automatic relays on Earth. Good. This must be Chapman's ship. What else can it be? Captain Beecher and Lieutenant White are to report to the briefing room immediately and stand by for takeoff. Now report immediately any news or anything unusual on your radio and radar relays. Yes, sir. The rescue ship is in the countdown phase, sir. They're waiting for your final operation orders. Put me through to the captain of the rescue ship on launching. Beecher. This is Lansfield. Yes, Colonel. Major, your final instructions are being teletyped on your recorders. Yes, sir. As you know, something unusual must have happened to Chapman and McConan. And I don't mind telling you that it's of greatest importance to space travel that we find out exactly what happened to these two men. So blast off and good luck. We'll do our best, Colonel. Captain Beecher, over. Lunar Base 1 to Pegasus 4. We read you, Captain Beecher. Good work. Stand by for Colonel Lansfield. Beecher, how are they? They're not. I mean, there's no one on board. There isn't a sign of life. Two men just don't get up and walk off a rocket in the middle of space? No, sir. 
Then what the devil? Chapman recorded a final message, sir, but it doesn't make sense. Our repro units are picking it up. We're examining it. Can you bring her in? I'll have to check out the instruments, but I think so. All right, give it a try. White can bring your ship in. Yes, sir. And Beecher. Yes, sir. Good luck. these conditions. I must know more about the directional flight machine. When the time comes. Well, the time has come. I want to speak to Sesson. And right now. Very well. Father. Frank Chapman wishes to speak with you. Do you want to talk about Liara? That isn't what I came here to discuss. My work has reached a stage and I need to know more about your gravity control. It is too soon. Now, how do we know he's not a spy for the Solarites? You are too distrusting, Heron. All right. You may see it. The density of our planet made it possible for us to advance gravity and therefore anti-gravity theories. It's beyond me. Einstein was working on this problem, but he died before he could complete his investigations. What causes Rayton's high density? The atoms on this planet have narrower electronic orbits than the atoms on most other planets. The smaller they become, easier it is for us to control and take advantage of positive and negative gravity. Why is Rayton getting smaller? This planet is slowly using up the energy that holds the atomic particles together. You mean you might disintegrate into nothing? Yes, someday. But it will not be in our time. Well, I guess it's the same as on Earth. We don't seem to worry that our sun might be cooling off in many millions of years. Uh, the danger for us is that sudden bursts of concentrated heat directed on our ray tongue might suddenly speed up the process of time. You think that's possible? Uh, we have enemies who want our knowledge of gravity and who know our weakness. You're expecting an attack? When you have enemies, you always expect an attack. I've had a chance to talk to you alone. How is it you're more different than the others? Well, I don't mean your silence. I, I mean you're warmer. Uh, sensitive. That wasn't really a question, because I know you can't answer. I just wanted you to know how I feel. It's a strange world. I don't want to hurt Liara. You don't either, do you? I like you.
charges to make against the Earthman Chapman. He is imposing himself both on Liara, your daughter, and the mute girl, Zeta. Now, this is an insult to Liara. You know I love her. And a direct insult to me. I am asking. Rather, I am demanding your permission to challenge him to the duel. You sent for me? Yes. I have reports about you that are not good. That you're causing much trouble. What am I supposed to have done now? You are forcing your attentions on Liara. And then on the mute girl, Zeta. That's not true. Why don't you ask them? He lies, Cyrus. Is it true? Has he forced himself or his attentions upon you? Why would she admit it? Perhaps she's afraid of it. Being mute, she's unable to defend herself. Maybe she's protecting me. Listen, I'm not going to be put on trial or questioned by you or anyone else for something I haven't done. You know, buddy, I don't like you. Maybe it's a carryover from Earth and not good taste. But I'd like to hang one on you. Chapman, Haran has challenged you to the duel of Brayton. Do you accept his challenge? A duel for what? What kind of a duel? This guy doesn't look very honest to me. A duel of bravery. You know, Mr. Sesson, maybe this duel business is a good idea. Might clear the air a little. So how do we go about it? Heron, you know the rules for the duel of Rayton. But for him, I'll have to explain and show the results. Chapman, come here. Those are gravity plates that we've had placed here. Their intensity is so high that any object or any person placed on any one of them would immediately disintegrate. Here, let me show you. Rayton is one of physical strength and skill. You will use this rod and attempt to push your opponent on top of one of the gravity plates. You saw what happened to the rock. Get ready. Put the combat rod in position. my signal, you will start the duel. There can be no quarter called and no quarter given. The fate of the victim is in the hands of the victor. The moment has come. At my light signal, you will proceed.
want to. I don't believe in it. In this case, killing him would have accomplished nothing. But Heron wouldn't have shown you mercy. He'd have killed you because he wants me. But I don't love him. I love you. If you'd felt anything for either one of us, you could have stopped this duel. What? You know what I think? I think you were waiting to see which one of us won and then take the one that was left over. What? No, Leah, I don't love you. I don't even know if I like you. But let me tell you this. You can't make someone love you. It's got to come naturally. You, you can't force it. You can't command it. If you do that, you'll never find it. Oh, this, this whole thing is, is like a nightmare to me. I miss my people. Well, I've got to make some attempt to get back. And if you feel anything for me, you'll try to help me. Well, perhaps you're right. Maybe I can help you. As you said, I don't want to kill you. I think I could understand your somewhat quaint language if I were on your earth a little. Well, why don't you kill me? You didn't kill me. You had the chance. Well, what about the knife? This isn't exactly what I'd call a friendly visit. If you help me, I have a plan whereby I might help you to leave our planet. Perhaps it will work. I don't see how this is possible. What about my size? I inspected your giant suit. And the oxygen tank holds air from your own world. Now, isn't that right? Yes, of course, but why? No, never mind that. It's not important. You see, the whole plan is based on the theory that your people are searching for you. Now, I must get you back before they attempt to find you here. I know they've been searching and will eventually zero in on this planet. I think I can get you back in time. Yes, but... Uh... You're doing this because of Liara, aren't you? Yes, I am. I'm in love with her. I don't think she loves me yet, but... Uh, perhaps with you gone, she will see things in more realistic light in time. Well, how can we get my suit into the open? I have some men I can trust. Incessant? No. You must never know. Otherwise, we both will be put to death. Two nights a week, I'm alone. In complete charge of the master control set. Can one man handle it? Yes. Yeah. And on one of those nights in the near future, while Sesame is sleeping, I will maneuver Raytown within a distance of your Earth's moon. You think they'll be able to see us? Precisely. They will investigate and find you. Go with it. What is this? What's happening? The siren means we're being attacked. Attacked by whom? Attacked by whom? The Solarites. We've been here too long. They've discovered our position. Who are the Solarites? I have no time to explain. I must help Cecil. What will this do to our plans? We must fight this off or no one will have any plans. Is everyone on the ground? Yes. Let me go.
they're safe for the moment. But I fear they won't give up so easily. Safe for the moment? Well, who are these solarites anyhow? They're from a sun satellite. For generations, they've been after our universal gravity control because they want to avoid being pulled into the sun. If we don't stop them, they'll eventually attack your Earth. Liara, show him the prisoner. Prisoner? Come. during the last war. The only one of their monsters that didn't die in the attack. When did this attack take place? Several years ago, when Zetha was a little girl. That's when she lost her voice. What makes those rocks disintegrate? It's as if they were hitting some invisible wall. That's exactly what it is. The monster is so strong that he can smash in the ordinary structure. Now, what you call an invisible wall is really another way that we use our gravitational control. Now, by using a high magnetic field, we can lock molecules so closely together that they form a solid wall. Take a big hit at MIT. Where? One of Earth's more advanced centers of learning. I only hope your wall will, will hold him in check. Yes. He could kill us all if he escaped life on other planets and we were always wondering if ours was the only one so blessed there are many inhabited worlds but only these fire people bother us <laughs> on that one before. What are we going to do? We must try to break up the attack. things. Outrun them or fight them. Well, breaking up a formation is one thing, but how can you fight them? Do you have a chance? We have to settle that once and for all. Living in constant danger isn't worthy of us. But don't forget, we still have the gravity control. The greatest danger to us is the high intensity heat bomb. That's right. They have enough concentrated heat to blow up our planet instantly. What would you do? I would fight. And you? Fight. Right. That's exactly my decision. Prepare for battle. Sharp acceleration for attack position. Maneuver so that we face the enemy when they attack. Heron, 
Alert our units to be ready for frontal attack. All units, prepare for frontal attack. Activate the gravity curtain. Deeply plagued with regret when I'm forced to destroy. If it wasn't them, it would have been you. Perhaps you are right. You are wise, Chapman. One day you and Harren will lead our people. Well, I'm honored and grateful. I but... will teach him all he needs to know. She went to sleep early. Sleep? I'm very tired. Perhaps the battle was too much of a strain on me. Good night. Good Sleep night, well, Father. Sasson.
was that? It's over there. I think it was a solarite. Are you all right? I... What happened? I don't know. Was it the solarite? Did you see him? It was terrible. Through that corridor, it's shorter. Right. But be careful. I'll be all right. I'll be all right. Oh, Heron. Zeta, are you all right? Turn to your world. Yes, but... Well, then tonight's the best time. You see, the chaos of battle has brought us closer to your moon than we've ever been. It'll be a simple task to maneuver Raton slowly and steadily even closer, and the risk will not be so great because the travel time will be short. And we'll be well within the range of moon's radar. Yes, but we cannot go unnoticed. Now, as soon as we're within range of your moon, my men will carry your suit out into the open. Now, if your people come to investigate, we'll pull them into our gravity and direct their landing. Meanwhile, you will enter your suit, seal it up, so that you're not exposed to our atmosphere and all the rest you know. Where shall I meet you? In the control chamber. Someone will come for you. Zeta. It's you. Yes, Frank Chapman. But you can talk. From my fight when I thought you were going to be killed, something happened. After I screamed, I found I was able to speak. Safer. I have many things to say to you, Frank Chapman. It's so wonderful you being able to talk. And I have so many things to say to you. Oh, everything has been terrible. You're so lovely. You have such an adorable little face. Chapman, I've been in love with you since the first time I saw you. And I've never been able to speak a word of it until now. But as I know, my love for you is so strong. So 
I also know that you will leave. I must leave. Shall be close enough for you to be found. Lunar Base One to Rocket Ship Three Eight Zero. Over. This is Rocket Ship Three Eight Zero to Lunar Base One. Over. Radar has just picked up a giant asteroid. Identity unknown. Cannot find any record of it in the space charts. The Phantom Planet. Give us exact position of asteroid. Nine degrees in northern cluster field, and I have an order from Colonel Lansfield. You are to land on this asteroid and send White to investigate. I... I hope you will find happiness back with your people. You would be my happiness. You're over there. Frank Chapman, please. You must take the stone. It will be a good luck charm. Hold on to it. It will help you to go back safely to your people. Keep it. And remember, Mac. I love you. Yes, Sarah. I'll keep it forever. Just confirmed it. A rocket similar to yours is heading in our direction. I hope it won't crash. <laughs> Don't worry. I have the best man on gravitation control. And I have another man who's coming to help me turn on the oxygen tanks as soon as you're in your suit. Thank you, Han. You know, we've become friends here. Good friends. We would have become friends anywhere. Your planet or my Earth. I wish you and me are much happiness. Other people. 
I think he's in a state of shock. Do you need assistance? No, Captain. I can handle him alone. You know, Frank, you're a lucky guy. This is a wandering planet. Could have carried you anywhere. I'm sure glad we found you. Say so. Where is she? What you need is a rest. for immediate takeoff. How do you feel, Chapman? I don't know. I don't understand. It's unbelievable. We'll get you back to Moon Base for a thorough examination. Do you think you're hurt? I don't think so. You must have been knocked out for quite a while. I must have been dreaming. Quite possible you were delirious. The shock of the crash landing of your ship. Ray's gone. But I just left safe in Heron. ready for firing. Stand by for countdown. The gravity of this planetoid is very strong. We'll need every bit of thrust for our takeoff. Don't worry. I know we're going to make it. Start your countdown. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, zero.